，下面一个为我们分享的是 Boo s h o c k n e g g e 他为我们呃介绍的是，呃，为速度表现构建力量训练。呃，布，他是一个呃，他是一个非常有经验的美国田径运呃教练员，然后他是。呃，拥有三十四年的经验的传奇田径教练，擅长呃跳远、呃、短跑和投掷项目，然后专精于生物力学、力量训练和康复训练。然后他现在是路易斯安那州立大学的田径体能教练。呃，他曾经获得呃，他指导的呃运动员曾经获得二十次的 NCAA 的冠军，然后也执教过十七位奥林匹克运动员。下面我们就来开始他的讲座。Hello, everyone. Our topic today is designing weight training to improve、uh, speed acquisition. Let's start by discussing、uh, speed as a talent or as an ability.、Uh, speed is a neural quality. If you have two athletes who look alike and one is fast and one is slow, the reason why the Fast one is fast, and the slow one is slow, is because the fast one has a nervous system that is better at activating muscle tissue.、Uh, there isn't much difference in the muscle itself. The ability of the nervous system to activate the muscle tissue is the discerning factor there. Now, this activation, basically, when we look at the physiology of it, takes three forms. The first is recruitment. The、uh, ability of the nervous system to produce electrical energy to achieve the thresholds of response of those individual motor units. The second and probably most important is rate coding. Rate coding refers to the ability to send electrical pulses frequently at a high rate uh, to the uh, uh, to stimulate the muscle tissue, decreasing the relaxation phases of the mus muscle、uh, contraction process. So effectively, you are not changing the muscle, but you're activating the muscle at a higher level and in a more frequent way, and you get more work out of the muscle without any change in the muscle. And then finally, synchronization of the individual motor units that comprise the muscle result in a more forceful and quicker contraction.、Uh, there's a certain ideal order and a certain cascading effect as these motor units、uh, contract, and by polishing that up and Creating more efficiency there, you can enhance、uh, contraction speeds as well. So these three things will kind of group together into the long-term neuromuscular integration. Again, referring to the ability of the nervous system to activate muscle tissue. Now, speed is a desirable quality, of course, and we all coach for speed. And when we want to make our athletes faster, there are basically two parts of the process. The first is that we have to design and implement good speed development programming. You know, write good workouts and implement them correctly. And then the other part, which kind of flies under the radar sometimes, is that we have to eliminate any, any obstacles to speed acquisition that might be occurring in any in、uh, any other area of the program. Quite often. Uh, Well-designed speed training doesn't take root simply because the fitness training is done incorrectly, or the weight training is done incorrectly, or there are other deficiencies in the program. So, knowing how to organize the other parts of the program in order to allow the speed、uh, development stuff to do its、uh, best work is a very important part of the planning process as well. Now, when I say speed, I mean all of the forms of speed—not just running speed, but speed of movement, explosive power, and so on. They're similar in origin. Now, I'll ask the question: Why do you train speed? Well, the obvious reason is to get faster and be more powerful to improve athletic performances. But there are some other reasons why, and one is to improve neuromuscular integration. Speed training—you know, speed and power training、uh, with high speeds of movement and high power outputs. Drive increases and improvements in rate coding capabilities and recruitment capabilities. So, by training speed, you're teaching the nervous system to become better at activating muscle tissue. And the other reason why is to increase the levels of localized tension that you apply、uh, during exercise.、Um, if you are an athlete and you lift regularly and you do a lot of normal training, but you never sprint or never really do plyometrics. If you would suddenly introduce sprinting or plyometrics into the program, you would be sore as heck the next day. And the reason why is because the tension levels that the muscles and connective tissues experience in the sprinting and in the plyometrics are higher than they are in the weight training that you were doing. 
So ultimately, speed and power training enable us to apply higher levels of tension than we would be able to apply otherwise. That's very important uh, because this kind of points to a unique relationship between speed and strength. You know, all of our lives, we've kind of been drilled to think that I become stronger, therefore I'll become faster. But what this is telling us is that if we do speed training, we improve the nervous system's ability to activate muscle tissue, and we have higher levels of tension that are being applied, and those are the recipe for strength. So it works the other way around. Speed is a huge strength producer as well. And those two things are kind of like the chicken and the egg in, in many ways. So you have to kind of think of speed as almost a prerequisite for advanced level strength. And if you as a coach don't have a good speed development program and you're doing a lot of stuff in the weight room, well, your weight room is not operating at maximum efficiency regardless of how well it might be planned because uh, you're operating with a very low ceiling in the absence of any type of speed component in your training program. Now, a little bit about glycolytic uh, training. This is a little bit of a sidelight, but it's important to us. If you do really high level glycolytic or anaerobic training uh, and produce really high levels of acidity, well, the acidity is a neural irritant. It interferes with conduction at the neuromuscular junction. So therefore, speed and skill acquisition become very difficult for some time after doing that type of work. If you do that big, big running workout on a Monday and you have skill uh, or speed development on the Tuesday, it might be on the paper, but it's not going to happen because the body is not going to be biochemically receptive to it in that regard. So you have to be very careful about um, planning and implementing uh, this, these really high level glycolytic training bouts. Uh, on the other hand, glycolytic training at a more moderate level uh, produce, you know, of course, produces lactate. And lactate is one of the best things that you can do. It's one of the best chemicals we can produce in exercise because lactate produces very positive endocrine responses, you know, growth hormone responses and such. And they accelerate recovery and also improve the effectiveness of our speed and our power and our strength development programs. So that being said, uh, it's a good idea to have moderate levels of anaerobic glycolytic training in your program at all times for this reason. And the high-level glycolytic training, that needs to be like surgical shots, strategically placed, uh, so as not to interfere with speed acquisition. Um, and this moderate lactate production type of training can, res can be fitness training. I mean, it is a, a form of fitness training. And this is why I always say that if we really understand endocrine science, then your restoration training and your fitness training are going to look a lot alike. It's a very blurry line. They're very similar to each other. So I think it's important to have an understanding of how lactate affects the restoration process so that you can be more effective in your speed programming in order to produce the restoration. Now, looking at strength as an ability or as a talent, uh, again, strength, like speed, is a neural quality. It comes from neuromuscular integration. The recruitment rate coding and synchronization processes, when improved, increase strength levels. Now, it is true we can improve strength, particularly the slow forms of strength, through hypertrophy. But for athletic purposes, by far, the majority and the most important forms of strength improvement are neural in nature. And we should remember, of course, that the fast things we do, the speed and power training, those are the things that drive neuromuscular integration. If you want to improve recruitment and rate coding capabilities, it doesn't improve with the slow stuff, it improves with the fast stuff, and that's important to understand. So if you understand this, then you start to think that this neuromuscular integration is really a prerequisite to strength development. We actually have to understand that we use the speed and power training to assist in the development of strength, but the speed and power training actually potentiates the strength training. So by introducing speed into the program strategically, what we're actually doing is we're enabling our strength training to occur much more efficiently. We, uh, we uh, acquire strength at a faster rate as well. So the placement of speed in the program greatly assists in strength if we understand this potentiation effect as well. Now, some key supporting concepts. First, we've already mentioned how neuromuscular integration, you know, rate coding is driven by speed and power training. That's how we get improvements there. 
But ultimately, our training program is about intensity and the progressions of intensity. You know, if we achieve high intensities, that drives strength increases in our weight training program. So high intensity produces the strength increases, and that's what we should be. We should be an intensity-driven program. I always say the level of intensity you achieve is the level of performance you can expect. Of course, that doesn't mean we go about it haphazardly and without care, but still, intensity is of what we actually try to increase and progress in our training schemes. Now, what about the less intense forms of training, things that we do that are not explosive or things that we do that might be explosive but aren't really a quite high intensity as some of the others? Well, these things are important as well because they provide endocrine support in many instances. They drive hormonal responses that are very important to support our strength training, speed training efforts. And also, that type of training often provides stimulation. You know, if you're training at a real high intensity, you can't train at certain high intensities very regularly. You know, those bouts of work are going to have to be spaced out. And if we understand rate coding capabilities and know that when we don't train, they tend to, to fall off, well, sometimes these bouts of training are actually geared to maintain uh, rate coding capabilities through stimulation in between the very high intensity types of workouts. Of course, over time, we start with lower intensities and we progress to high intensities. But once we get to higher intensities, you know, we never really just stay there. We kind of bounce back and forth between the high intensity and the low intensity work. In the weight room, once you start lifting heavy, you don't do everything heavy. You bounce back and forth between light work and heavy work over time. And this, in many situations, this lighter work is what's providing this endocrine support and the stimulation that you need in between those sessions. And keep in mind, if high intensity is our goal, the safe achievement of high intensity is our goal, well, then we have to understand density. You know, if we are going to train at high intensities, we can't train as frequently. So we need more time, more space in between those sessions. So density always allows intensities to progress if it's properly managed. Uh, many times uh, we're kind of like we work out on Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the weight room, and that might be perfectly fine when you're lifting light. But once you start lifting heavy or lifting faster and the intensities achieve a certain amount, you might need extra days in between those sessions in order to support that. So just understand that every time we see or need an increase in intensity, there has to be an increase in the rest and restoration component to support that. And if that's the case, density is the variable that we're typically working with. Diversity is an important part of our training. Uh, almost all of our um, um, injuries in sport that are non-contact in nature result from repetitive movement. So if I do the same things all the time, well then ultimately I don't have any variance in movement patterns and the risk of repetitive movement types of syndromes goes up dramatically. So diversity in the program and diversity in our exercise choices mitigates this risk. And we'll discuss that a little more as we move forward. Another thing that I feel strongly about is keeping things real simple in your weight training program. Keep in mind that two things we're after here. We want power output, whether it's fast power output or loading or whatever the case may be. But the power output is what we have to get because that's what drives the neural improvements. And then another key factor is the amount of muscle mass that's involved. The more muscle mass that's involved in the exercise, the greater the endocrine responses are going to be. In short, you can be fast and explosive or you can be fancy. In short, you can be heavy or you can be fancy. In both situations, you can't be both. So if you pick exercises that are overly complicated, or if you're kind of a student of the YouTube training program with all of the sexy stuff you see there, well, ultimately, you're going to fall short as far as neural improvements and endocrine responses, which are by far the most important things that you're doing there. That's where your big gains are actually taking place and coming from. So that being said, if an exercise is overly complicated to the point where you can't be explosive, or if an exercise is uh, overly complicated to where mu large muscle groups are no longer involved, well, then you pay a price in that respect. Right? And then finally, power output is important, maintaining it. 
you know, the first set's fast, the last set's got to be fast. You know, the quality, whatever that may be, at the beginning and at the end should be comparable. We don't want to set ourselves up uh, with dropping power outputs in weight training sessions because doing so basically puts us in bad biochemical situations. You know, we start to see things flip into the catabolic side. So that being said, maintaining the power output whether it's by measurement or whether it's you just watching carefully or whatever, that's a very important concept in order to support training effectively. Now, I'm a strong believer in training by body type. We all individualize our training, but I don't believe necessarily in individualizing by sport or by, uh, or by position. I like to individualize by body type because I view speed, power, and strength as global qualities. You know, they're not really sport-specific qualities; they're global qualities um, that that are much more generic in that way. So I typically look at body types and I make decisions on training based upon those body types. And for the sake of simplicity here in our presentation, we'll call those small people and big people. Now I want to train my small people and big people the same, you know, because ultimately. Uh, we want them both to be strong and fast and explosive. So we want to observe the same uh, same um, uh, uh, philosophical approaches there, quality-based, intensity-based approaches to training. However, our big people are built, are not built to run, they're built to lift. And our small people are not really built to lift, they're built to run. So ultimately, the big people are going to do a little more lifting and the small people will do a little less lifting. Now, that being said, I, I believe strongly in both situations about paring down the list of weight training exercises in any particular session. Um, I think that in order to support quality and support intensities, you can't be doing a lot. Even with the big people, you kind of have to limit what you're doing with your training. You know, you limit the list or you expand it just a little with the big people, but you're never looking at a long laundry list of things to do in the weight room. If you go into the weight room and you have six or seven or eight major exercises to accomplish, well then basically you're never going to get the power output you want. You're not going to achieve the intensities that you need in order for your athletes to show long-term progress. Uh, however, if you give them just a few things with multiple sets to do them and they do them really well, you get the quality you need. Athletes can focus in a little better because there's not that many things to do. And because you have multiple sets, then you start to see rhythmic improvements as you move from set to set to set to set. And quite often the last set is the best of the session, even though there might be a little fatigue starting to set in. So that being said, um, I really think you have to keep that list short. When I bring small people into the weight room, most cases they're only doing like three exercises. When I bring big people into the weight room, sometimes it's as little as three. Typically it's never more than about five exercises. Now I do understand and value the secondary lift philosophy. You know, if you are a uh, classically trained strength and conditioning coach, you use this. You know, if you maybe do a lot of squatting, for example, you do all your squats, and then that fatigues a lot of muscle fibers. So I then move on to a step up or a lunge or some secondary leg lift. And that secondary lift kind of goes in there and trains those fibers that might have escaped during the squat workout. And that's a very valuable philosophy and I use that as well. But it doesn't mean that the secondary lift has to be on the same day in the same session. And a lot of my secondary lift kind of stuff is circuit training type of stuff done on the subsequent day. And that enables me to keep that list really short and allow the athletes to show really good power outputs, uh, do a few things really well, rather than doing a whole bunch of things with limited power outputs. Now, I'm a strong believer in compatible training. Uh, if we want adaptations to occur quickly and at high, and we see and see high levels of adaptation, the messages that we send, the biochemical messages we send to the body's adaptive process at the cellular level need to be extremely clear. If we send conflicting messages as to the nature of adaptation that we want, then we don't see the adaptations take place very quickly, if at all. So this is why I always try to group my training appropriately. And doing this, I group by what I call neuromuscular demand. 
What I typically do is I have two types of days, what I call neural days and general days. On neural days, I like to group together all of the things that are neural in nature, that are neurally demanding, like speed work, plyometric work, and your major lifting exercises. On the other hand, other days, this is where the, anything that's uh, physiological in nature, whether it be fitness training, restoration, or whatever, those things kind of go into those sessions. Those things like body weight exercises, general strength, medicine ball, your circuit training, fitness work, those kind of go together. And I try not to mix and match. Again, the idea of being sending extremely clear messages to the body's adaptive processes within a 24-hour window so that we get the maximum biochemical understanding of what those adaptations need to be. Now, I'm a firm believer in Olympic lifting. You know, when I look at Olympic lifts, I see complex strength being de developed. You know, when you're coming off the floor, it's a max strength or an absolute strength exercise. The bar speeds up and it's a power exercise. Then you catch it and you give a little and it becomes a reactive strength or an elastic exercise. And you take this and at the same time, when you start to look at uh, firing patterns, knee, hip, and ankle, and you start to look at upper body versus lower body firing sequences, there's a lot of skill there in, as well. So you put all of this complex strength development together with this skill, and what you see is a very complex strength development exercise that shows lots of skill transfer into actual sports and such themselves. So I'm a firm believer in it. It's by far the biggest thing that I do in the cornerstone of my program. I'm kind of a womb to the tomb, you know, day one to day last person as far as Olympic lifting is concerned. And there's one other reason why. Olympic lifting, unlike other forms of lifting, there are practically no negative side effects to it. You know, outside of the immediate fatigue associated with the workout, there really isn't any baggage that comes along with Olympic lifting. Yeah, it's a little bit of work to teach it. And yeah, sometimes you have to put in a little extra effort there. But, you know, that's why coaches make the big bucks, right? Now, looking at exercises like squats and press, and by the way, uh, when I say this, you know, these are what I commonly call like static lifts. So your squat moves, your major press moves, things like deadlifts, you know, basically all of your heavy, slower kind of stuff. Um, these are great exercises, but I always find a dilemma. Uh, I always find uh, issues there because I think there are upsides and downsides to doing these exercises. The pros of these types of exercises, you get huge strength development. The bigger one, because there are lots of ways you can get strength development, but you get huge endocrine responses from this. So these types of exercises move the needle on hormonal levels more than anything else that you do. And when you do these things right through big ranges of motion, a lot of imbalances become corrected. You know, um, you start an athlete squatting deep when they've squatted shallow all of their life and suddenly you find the core engaged, you find the posterior chain engaged, anterior dominance practically disappears, everything just kind of balances out. So in short, I believe very strongly in these exercises for those reasons. But I do know there are a couple of serious negatives that come along with these. By doing these, uh, you see some elasticity losses short term and you see some discoordination short term. And I'm personally I'm convinced that this is because these are the type of exercises that uh, because of the long, slow tension levels that are applied to the muscle tissues, uh, I think the muscle spindles, the proprioceptive organs that we call muscle spindles become fatigued. And as a result, you're just not as elastic and coordinated as you ordinarily would be. So that's a bit of an issue here because we want our athletes that they're elastic and coordination best for the most part. And we always want that when they're doing speed-based type of training. So that being said, these types of exercises need to be scheduled in a certain way that they won't interfere with speed acquisition elsewhere in the program. So now that we know that these uh, squats and presses, these heavy, slow lifts, have definite advantages and definite disadvantages, how will we manage them? Well, these are my solutions. The first one is I try to minimize exposure to those lifts. Uh, I try to shorten the window of time during which we are concentrating on uh, heavy, slow, different uh, types of weight training exercises like squats and presses and such uh, to minimize that damage. A second key factor is patience and progression. It's important to understand that um, when you have a young athlete in your program in the first year, you're not going to achieve all of your long-term goals uh, 
um, regarding proficiency in these types of exercises in the first year. And I understand that it's going to take a couple of years, maybe even three years, before you finally get these athletes where you need them in this particular type of work. Third and probably most important is preceding it with neuromuscular integration work. Uh, in order for you to uh, perform these exercises and to acquire strength quickly, uh, the nervous system has to be effective at activating muscle tissue. If you are trying to uh, do these exercises and gain absolute or maximal strength, well, while the nervous system is not effective at activating muscle tissue, it's going to take a lot longer and it's going to be a much slower process. So what I typically do, and this is one of the keys to my long-term periodization, and I think an important part of, of uh, of just speed training in general is understanding that this type of work needs to be preceded with neuromuscular integration work. So to make it simple, what I'll typically do is a phase of training, uh, the first phase of training in the training year that features a lot of explosive lifts, you know, explosive things like Olympic lifts in the 60, 65% zone, you know, fast bars and lots of other uh, simple, basic explosive types of activities. These type of activities improve neuromuscular integration, they improve rate coding capabilities, and the nervous system's ability to activate muscle tissue goes up dramatically. Then move into an absolute strength or maximal strength phase where you emphasize squats and presses and similar exercises. By doing this work first, effectively, when you get into the uh, time of the year when you're going to emphasize the squats and presses, the athletes will acquire strength much, much faster because of the efficiency of the nervous system at activating muscle tissue. So that's a key concept to understand. If you do neuromuscular integration work beforehand uh, uh, in, in your training sequences, then when you move into the next phase where you're emphasizing these things, it just goes much, much, much better. And the other element here to remember is if you're able to get your athletes stronger, then they acquire the negatives at a much less or much lower rate. So for example, if a good neuromuscular integration work uh, phase prior to your absolute strength or maximal strength phase enables you to get strong twice as fast, well, not only have you gotten strong twice as fast, you know, less tissue damage, joint damage, and so forth, that's a huge advantage, but if you've gotten strong twice as fast, you have also decrease the negatives you've accumulated by half along those times. So by shortening that window of squat and press exposure with that neuromuscular integration work done beforehand, you not only get stronger faster, but you accumulate the negatives, the discoordination, the elasticity losses at a slower rate. And this is one of the keys to the periodization of scheme that I use. Uh, and why I feel that a lot of the speed work that I do is a lot more effective because I manipulate it in this way. A lot of people just feel that it's day one, so it's time to get serious about squats and presses, and that's just not the case. Kicking it back a little bit later in the, uh, the long-term training uh, scheme uh, is much more effective if you're doing the right stuff um, um, in your first phase. And then finally, sometimes uh, once you get into the season or other times, there just comes a time when you're going to have to discontinue this stuff. Uh, or if you're not going to discontinue it, you need some really special strategies uh, as far as it's their usage at certain times of the year. And we'll talk about these in more detail a little bit later. When I talk about discontinuing exercises like squats and presses, a lot of people get really nervous about strength losses and those types of things. But it's important to remember that there are lots of ways to get strong and lots of ways to stay strong. And anytime you apply tension to a muscle or connective tissue, you're effectively producing strength. And one of the tools that I use at particular times of year in order to apply this tension is what I call ballistic lifting. Ballistic lifting, explosive types of lifting, exercises like weighted jumps and speed presses, light exercises with high speeds of movement and a large elastic component produce very high levels of tension. So they're very good at producing strength and also very good at maintaining strength. Now, this, these high levels of tension are not very damaging proprioceptively. Whereas when we do heavy slow squats, heavy slow presses, the time under tension, the fact that the muscle spenders are under tension for extremely long periods of time seems to do damage. So the point I'm getting at here is that when I um, 
am going to discontinue or at least de-emphasize the heavy slow forms of lifting, then I move into a ballistic lifting type of program. And now, because the time under tension variable is short, then we suddenly don't have all of these same baggage and the same problems associated with those types of lifts, but the tension levels are still high enough to maintain strength and possibly in many situations even continue to improve strength. Normally when I do these exercises, I'm working in percentages of body weight, anywhere from 10 to 50% of body weight, normally five to 12 repetitions and four to six sets per body region, body region meaning lower body or upper body. Now, five to 12 reps is a big range, I understand, and power output considerations are normally going to dictate the range of motion. You know, if I'm doing deep squat jumps, I know that my athletes, because of the deep positions and the large amount of muscle mass involved, they're going to get tired pretty quickly, so we stay to the lower end of the rep range. On the other hand, if we're using shallow squat jumps or something along those lines, I can easily achieve 10 or 12 repetitions with no power fall off at all. Uh, I often employ this same principle with presses by using a speed bench, speed incline, those types of exercises with either full or half ranges of motion. And the key thing here is to remember that what you're trying to do is, in addition to the speed, power, and, the, and so forth, what you're trying to do is you're trying to um, teach athletes to be proficient in eccentric to concentric conversion in lots of different ways and lots of different situations. So I think it's critical that you constantly vary the training parameters. You want to cons cons constantly change and change it up between unilateral and bilateral, deep positions, shallow positions, uh, lighter weights, heavier weights, and so forth, so that every workout is a little different than the one before. One of the favorite workouts that I do with elite athletes is I'll put six bars on the platform, each one weighs something different, and they have to move from bar to bar to bar over the course of the workout doing squat jumps with each bar. And it's interesting to see how the varying loads from set to set to set force them to make changes. And ultimately, this is what we want them to be able to do to handle different patterns of eccentric activity effectively and efficiently. Before you start lifting weights, you've got to have an idea of where you're going, you know, what type of balanced uh, strength development you're trying to achieve and what targets you're trying to reach. And uh, so a little bit of a discussion here about what we're ultimately trying to achieve. I'm a firm believer in balanced development of strength. It's critical to understand that different forms of strength need to progress simultaneously and at similar rates. So absolute strength, you know, the slow forms of strength, explosive power, and your jump type, plyo type, elastic uh, strength, those need to progress and need to stay in balance. And that's the key to effective movement patterns. This is the key to movement efficiency. Just general quality of movement is good when these three things stay in balance. When one of these gets too big and others become too small, this is when you start to see poor movement uh, quality. Uh, if you want good sprint mechanics, good acceleration mechanics, good change of direction, good deceleration abilities, it's important that the ratio between these different types of strength is appropriate at any particular time of year, particularly your critical competition times of the year. Many, many times we see athletes who advance the slow forms of strength, absolute strength, maximal strength, uh, to extremely high levels while not keeping up the power and elastic strength levels uh, in, to comparable levels, and next thing you know, you've got a muscle head who just doesn't move very well. What I continually look for, and I've kind of designed my weight training long, time, long term to produce these particular ratios, I look for a roughly, again, not perfectly, but roughly, when we examine uh, single rep maxes, a one to one to 1 1.5 ratio when we look at the clean to bench to deep squat. So one to one to 1.5 ratio of those three particular exercises. I find that anytime you are hovering around that particular value and those particular ratios, you're going to find your athletes move well, stop well, change direction well, uh, mechanics, generally speaking, sprint mechanics, acceleration mechanics just tend to fall into place. Uh, whenever the deep squat or the bench get bigger than those particular ratios, typically you see speed, um, related qualities decrease. 
On the other hand, uh, you got somebody who's all dressed up with nowhere to go. If you've got someone who's really big on the clean and doesn't show any proficiency at all in those other two exercises. And I should mention, by the way, also that um, the uh, bench, if it lags a little behind, particularly with females, that's not a big deal. But if you show me an athlete who's got a bigger bench and they're clean, I'll show you somebody who's got a big problem. And it's often why the NFL Combine, you know, you see athletes sprinting who look like tractor drivers, uh, the way they move their upper bodies, because those athletes are obviously so bench press dominant. So this is what I try to, to do. And I've adjusted my set rep, you know, total volume type of schemes long term to produce these types of numbers. Um, when I look at the absolute strength values, particularly in the deep squat. Um, I noticed that performance typically goes up as the deep squat, the deep slow heavy squat sub parallel goes up to a point. Um, at some point in time, that doesn't really contribute anymore to speed related qualities at all. And I think that if you go even further, you get to a point where it actually becomes a hindrance to speed. So my athletes, I'm kind of targeting them deep squatting, uh, sub-parallel, genuine single rep max, uh, about two times their body weight. And I find that once you get past about 2.2 or 2.3 times their body weight, then it actually produces more problems uh, than solutions, to be frank with you. So that's kind of a key thing there. I treat athletes a little differently uh, once they have achieved those levels of performance in a squat exercise. Uh, once they can do those things, I just treat them a little differently and periodize things a little differently for them. I'll explain in detail a little bit later. One of the forms of weightlifting that I use that's kind of out of the box is bodybuilding. Uh, bodybuilding is does not at all resemble uh, the grease up and pose competitive bodybuilding. It's just a track and field term for that type of lifting. But anyhow, bodybuilding is basically a weight training circuit. It's circuit style work. Uh, you choose a variety of exercises, all smaller muscle group exercises. So there are no Olympic lifts or uh, major squat moves or press moves in the circuit. 24 total sets of work, 10 repetitions with the 10th rep kind of challenging you a little bit, and then 60 to 90 second recoveries. And this work is particularly valuable because it hits a number of endocrine uh, sweet spots. One of the advantages is the short-term endocrine stimulation you get from it. Uh, you see serum testosterone and serum uh, growth hormone levels spike a bit as a result of this type of work. So you get an immediate restoration benefit. Many athletes that I've been coaching for a long time, uh, when they feel bad, they come and ask me for this particular type of work. Also, you see long-term fitness improvements in the endocrine sense as well. Uh, if you bodybuild frequently, say uh, two or three times a week for six to eight weeks, then the pituitary gland seems to reset and these increased endocrine outputs become semi-permanent. And even if you quit doing this work, you continue to enjoy the benefits of that accelerated hormonal output. That's a pretty good deal. You can also uh, improve glycogen storage with this type of work. If you do a tough workout and depress glycogen levels, this type of work afterwards will allow the athletes to recover quicker, but will also depress the glycogen levels further. And by depressing the glycogen levels further, uh, you get a more urgent and more complete supercompensation as far as glycogen storage is concerned. Of course, if nutrition is okay. And then finally, uh, relating back to our previous slide, this is an opportunity for strength supplementation via the secondary lifts. Uh, as I said on the previous slide, uh, that secondary lift you do for a body region doesn't have to be on the same day. It can be on the next day. And putting all of your secondary lifts together into circuit form actually improves their effectiveness. Uh, if you, you know, if you're a classically trained strength coach, typically your secondary lifts or your auxiliary lifts, whatever you call them, are pretty much scattered throughout the program. However, if you take these types of lifts and put them together into these types of circuits, there are two tremendous advantages. One is that the list of things that you have to do on those key critical days is shorter, so you can focus in more, as we said earlier. And then secondly, uh, the endocrine responses for each build upon each other. 
rather than having small endocrine responses from a few exercises, you get endocrine uh, responses that build upon each other dramatically. So by the end of the circuit, you have a significant endocrine response, whereas if you had only done a few of these secondary types of lifts, uh, you wouldn't have enjoyed that benefit. So, um, you know, so in other words, it's like getting, it, it's like the, the uh, auxiliary lifts or your secondary lifts basically uh, perform better as a team when they're put together in this respect. And this is why quite often I'll do my major weightlifting sessions on one day with featuring Olympic lifts, squat moves, press moves, things of that nature, and then follow it the very next day with the circuit kind of like this. And since we know that pituitary gland kind of resets at a new level, typically in the early stages of training, early phases of the training calendar, you body build very frequently. And then you tend to either phase it out or cut it back quite a bit for the remainder of the season. Now, this is a little simplistic, but when I put a weight training program together, basically it's three phases. Uh, the first phase is a phase of neuromuscular integration improvement. The second phase concentrates on absolute or maximal strength development and advancing power. And then the third is, is uh, in-season training management. Um, how do you actually manipulate weight training during the competitive season? Now, these three phases sometimes represent uh, three chronological phases that are arranged in this particular order. But the way I coach, it's a little more like their modes of training because uh, they're, they're all should be considered not necessarily purely chronological phases, but philosophical approaches to training that may be applicable at different times of the year. So that being said, there may be times when you might bounce back and forth between one or two of these phases, and it won't always be phase one, phase two, phase three in chronological order. So tend to think of them more as philosophical approaches to training, uh, more so than distinct chronological phases, even though that's how we'll kind of look at it here in this presentation. The first phase, neuromuscular integration improvement, and our goals in this phase, basically two, we're trying to improve rate coding and recruitment capabilities. We're trying to improve the nervous system's ability to activate muscle tissues so that everything from this point forward goes better. The second goal is that our next phase is going to be an absolute strength phase. So here we're going to kind of touch on some of the things we'll need to do in the next phase in order to be prepared. We're not going to try to make significant gains in squat activities, press activities, those types of exercises here, but we are trying to position ourselves to make that move in the next training phase. Now our first goal, first goal here is improving rate coding and recruitment capabilities. And I would do this through basic power work. And what I do is I give the athletes high densities and high set numbers of light Olympic lifts. Um, typically, I'll keep the athletes, uh, for the most part, in the neighborhood of 18 total sets per week of Olympic lifts, normally like six sets a day for like three times a week or something like that. The bars are light, you know, 50 to 65 percent. This makes the bars fast and it also keeps it safe. And I do a little bit high on the reps, four to five repetitions, so I can get just a little bit of lactate in there so that there's actually a little bit of a restoration component built into this type of work as well. Now, one other thing that's very important at this particular time of the year and in this particular phase is acceleration development training. The short sprinting that you're doing at this particular time uh, also is a big part of driving these rate coding and recruitment capabilities as well. And it's equally valuable, just as equal as anything that you're doing in the weight room at this time. So in short, this particular philosophically approach to lifting is something that we use early. It's our predominant training agent for speed power at this time. And it's all about getting the nervous systems act better at activating muscle tissue. Now, as far as preparing for the absolute strength training in the next phase, we're going to employ traditional squat, press, or pulling movements. I don't go over 75%. Again, we're not trying to get strong. We're trying to position ourselves to become stronger in the next phase. Now, keeping everything in balance, these are my recommendations for repetitions. Small people, 30 repetitions total in a workout, a 6x5 or a 5x6 or something along those lines. Uh, would be a ceiling. Most of the time I'm hovering around 25. And for big people, I would keep the ceiling at about 45 reps per body region. 
Now, normally with small people, they'll do an upper body lift and a lower body lift, and the set rep schemes will total 30 reps or less. Uh, however, when I'm dealing with big people, uh, repetitive movement is a consideration, it's a problem. So what I'll typically do is I'll split the repetitions between two upper body exercises and two lower body exercises, just so that we're a little bit more diverse in our movement patterns and our um, uh, problems with um, repetitive movement types of syndromes are not gonna take root for it. Now, I do keep this super simple, you know, like real simple exercises, squat on Monday, front squat on uh, Friday, or you know, our, our, our bench on Monday, pullovers on, on Friday, or whatever the case may be. Just real simple approaches to lifting. Uh, save the fancy stuff, the complex stuff, for when you're going to need it. Everything's new to the athletes at this point, so there's really no need for you to be overly fancy to complex the, fire, the, the training stimulus. Now, in our second phase, absolute strength development and power advancement. Okay, here are our goals. We want to maintain contact with that basic power work that we said. We want to improve power production. We want to achieve significant increases in absolute strength or maximal strength if you need it. And if you have it, if you've already been strong, we need to reestablish those levels. We need to get back to where we were if you've been strong in the past, a different approach for different people. Now, as far as maintaining contact with the basic power work, the neuromuscular integration work that we discussed on the previous phase, it continues on a very regular basis. Again, it's kind of becomes our home base. And as we start to do more intense work, obviously our intense sessions are going to be spread out. So this type of work now shifts. This type of work in phase one was the tough training days. Now, these are the days that maintain stimulation between the tougher training days. So ultimately, the home base, it's something that we continually return to each time after a more intense type of session. We're going to try to improve our power production as well. So every once in a while, every other workout or every third workout, we up our intensities to the 70 to 85% range with two to four repetitions and kind of work in those medium intensity range. So we're kind of stepping it up just a little every so often. The idea being to bounce back and forth with our Olympic lifting program between our basic power stuff and this type of lifting, bouncing back and forth between light days and medium days. Now, significant increases in absolute strength for those who need it, right? So if you haven't gotten to where we need to be yet with absolute strength, this is where we're going to try to reach those goals. We typically are going to have one big day one, a week uh, and very simple approaches, you know, with just low rep, high intensity schemes with exercises like simple back squats or bench press or whatever the case may be, whatever your fundamental lower body and upper body exercises are, those are the ones that you're working for at this particular time of the year. I use a lot of six by twos and five by threes and sometimes on benches, you know, the five, four, three, two, ones, you know, those types of things, you know, reaching pretty high in intensity. The rep ceilings for my small body types are 15 for a body region. And for the bigs, my ceilings are 30 for per body region. And that, once again, um, only one exercise, uh, for the upper body, one exercise for the lower body, for the small people, for the bigs, 30 is a lot of reps at high intensity. So we'll typically split those between two exercises if I choose to go as high as 30 repetitions. Frankly, in many situations, I keep the big people in the low rep ranges as well. But if you do want to go up, I recommend uh, splitting between a couple of uh, between a couple of different exercises. Now, other days, you know, we're going to have that one heavy squat day, one heavy press day or whatever per week. What are you doing elsewhere in the program? Anytime that I have a very intense day, what I try to do is I try to mitigate injury of risk elsewhere in the program by diversifying. So on the other days, the lifting takes on these characteristics. I set the ceiling at about 80%. The repetition ceilings, again, are about 30 to 45, as they were with our basic preparation types of work. But the difference here is that we're going to use multiple exercises, two or three exercises per body region. By using multiple exercises, we have more diverse movement patterns in the workout. 
if I am going to squat heavy on a Monday, the last thing that I want to do is squat on other days of the week, you know, because we don't want repetition in the presence of high intensity. So typically these days are going to choose exercises or involve exercises that are not similar to those that we are using on the big heavy day at some other point in the week. And quite often, this is the best opportunity to do unilateral work, single arm work, uh, single leg work, those types of exercises. Also in this phase, we mentioned reestablishing, the key word being reestablishing absolute strength levels for those who had it. If we have an athlete who has had uh, good lifts in the past, a person who is pretty strong or has been strong, uh, it's not about trying to make progress. Like I said, once you get past maybe 2.2, 2.3 pounds their body weight, then normally advancing these exercises, a squat further than that would cause problems. So that being said, once they get back to that particular threshold, I normally don't do that type of work with them anymore. So this phase is all about getting back to where you were. And once you are, then I make the shift to a ballistic-based program. Sometimes I'll have these athletes do those types of exercises like heavy squats, whatever, maybe every other week and ballistic lift the remainder of the sessions in between. Sometimes I'll have them lift for a few weeks and then they'll shift over completely to the ballistic program. But I don't feel that these athletes should just continue to squat heavy once they've reached those key benchmarks, uh, basically. Uh, it makes it very difficult to keep things in balance, uh, and we tend to build muscle heads at that point. So once you get to that particular threshold and you're strong enough, then we shift over to ballistic types of things, and I don't continue to make you do that type of work just to say we're doing it. Now, phase three is an in-season training management phase. Our goals here are to establish a polarized approach to training, particularly in our Olympic lifting. We're going to introduce high-level power training, we need to maintain neural stimulation and maximize proprioceptive function. Let's take a look at how we'll do each of those. First of all, let's say a little bit about the polarized approach to training. Here, we don't want to lift in middle zones. Understanding that middle zones, um, the reason for lifting in the middle zones is to prepare us for the heavy work. Well, in this phase, we'll be doing the heavy work. So there is no more need for middle zone lifting. And the last thing I want is to have something in the program that is not intense enough to really help, but too intense to easily recover from. So everything we do in the program, particularly in the Olympic lifting program, is going to be super heavy or super light. Or hard. And that's kind of the approach that we're going to take as we move forward. Now, looking at introducing high-level power training, basically training for rate of force development here. So these would be low density, meaning once a week, and possibly even as little as once every 10 days, very high intensity. So we're looking at Olympic lifts at intensities of 90 up to 100%. And I do a lot of like 3-3-2-2-1-1s or 3-2-2-2-1-1s, those types of things. And quite often on the ones we're going at 100% or trying to go for PRs or those types of things. Again, very high intensity lifting with big loads, uh, but, very, but infrequently, typically every seven to 10 days or so. Now in between these heavy sessions, we have to maintain stimulation. So once again, our basic power type of work still remains in the program. Again, this is our home base. So in between those sessions, we're back at 60 to 65 percent with four to five reps, trying to get a moderate lactate response, fast bars, again, just maintaining rate coding capabilities in between those very intense sessions. Now, maximizing proprioceptive function is a critical component in season, of course. You want to be at your coordinative best and at your elastic best uh, in season. And basically, there are a couple of strategies that you can employ in order to make sure that this happens. The first one we discussed briefly is discontinuing uh, major squat and press types of exercises. These heavy, slow types of lifts do produce some discoordination and elasticity losses. So cutting them out altogether gives you uh, a, a good chance to be at your absolute sharpest during competition times. I do this all the time with small-bodied athletes. 
And what I do, as I mentioned before, is I introduce ballistic lifting for maintenance of strength and for enhancement of strength during these times. And I've never seen athletes miss a beat. They typically do perfectly fine for extended periods of time with the varied ballistic program. Now, sometimes when I'm dealing with uh, bigger bodied athletes or athletes that have, uh, in sports that have a very strong lifting culture, I might take a different strategy. And what I'll do with those athletes is I'll use a very high density, very low density squat press pull kind of strategy. So what I'll have them do are uh, um, doing, I'll have them do these exercises at very high intensities, intensities of 90% plus with low repetition schemes. For example, we might do a deep uh, sub-parallel uh, back squat, you know, six by two at 90% or a bench that's something like five by two at 95% or something along those lines. Uh, I think that the mistake we tend to make in these situations is that we tend to do this type of work far too often and far too light, keeping in mind that if you're going to do it, you want to do it with some intensity to get something out of it, particularly during your competition times. And you also want to allow times for those peripheral receptors to recover from this type of work. You know, the peripheral receptors will recover. But if you are filling in between these sessions with similar types of work, that won't be the case. So it's a true hit it and quit it type of philosophy as far as this type of work is concerned. It's not unusual for me maybe on a Monday for an athlete who compete on a Saturday on a Monday to have them do some type of work like this. And then for the remainder of the week, they're basically concentrating on strictly their Olympic lift and their ballistic work. And then they might not hit it again until like the following Monday or possibly even two Mondays from that point. So again, um, very low density, very high intensity. And in some ways, this can actually work in your favor. You know, proprioceptors are harmed short term by this type of work but anything that hurts you short term helps long term. So after maybe five days or so, uh, quite often you'll actually find that the proprioceptors super compensate and then the athletes are actually sharper than they were before. So again, this will work perfectly fine in sports where you compete on like a once a week type of schedule or such and don't compete that frequently. Um, if you understand to not litter the program with similar types of work and other slow, heavy types of lifts and allow the, the, um, the restoration and the supercompensation to occur. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, appreciate your attention. And uh, this is my contact information if you'd like to get in touch with me directly. Thank you to the clinic uh, directors for the invitation. And uh, I hope that uh, I was able to say something today that helps you. Thanks.